if you would, open with me in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 1 to 3. You can find it uh, in the Pew Bible on page 88. A little bit of a change of pace for us as we're not doing a whole chapter, but just a few verses together this morning. We've been working through Leviticus. We saw the several sacrifices that the people are commanded to bring, and then we moved into a section on the priesthood, and we saw the priests being ordained. And then last week we considered the priests beginning to serve as the people approached the Lord for worship through the priest with the sacrifice for the first time, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Fire came down from the presence of the Lord and consumed the sacrifice, and all the people fell on their faces and worship. And that's the context that we're moving through as we come into Leviticus 10. So let me go ahead and pray for us as we prepare to read God's word together. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your grace, your marvelous grace that is greater than all our sin. And we thank you of your word that tells us of your grace, that the grace of God has appeared when your son came and lived for us and died for us and rose again. And now we thank you that uh, in him, through your spirit, we have access to you and have the privilege of coming to hear you speak to us through your word. And so we pray, Lord, that you would speak, for your servants are listening. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, John Calvin has a, an essay, maybe a booklet. It's not quite the, the length of a book, but it's shorter than that, that he wrote when uh, the emperor had summoned together many to uh, review things that are going on in the church and to evaluate what's going on. And he wrote uh, an essay to encourage the emperor there to consider the cause of the Reformation. And this essay is now titled, The Necessity of Reforming the Church. And shortly after he begins that, very close to the beginning of that writing, he says this, If it be inquired, then, by what, by what things, chiefly, the Christian religion has a standing existence among us and maintains its truth, it will be found that the following two occupy not only the principal place, but comprehend under all of them the other parts, and consequently the whole substance of Christianity. Namely, a knowledge first of the mode in which God is duly worshipped, and secondly, of the source from which salvation is to be obtained. Where these are kept out of view, though we may glory in the name of Christians, our profession is empty and vain. That's a striking statement. Consider what Calvin is saying there. He's saying if you want to know how Christianity is recognized and sustained, if you want to know what it consists in, there, there's two primary things you need to know. First, the right way in which God is worshipped. And second, the way that sinners can find salvation in Christ. And somewhat uncomfortably for us, he lists worship first. I don't know that I would have been bold enough to do such a thing. But he says the first is the right way in which God is worshipped. And though that may sound odd to us, I think it's reflecting a deep biblical reality that worship is the goal for which we were created and redeemed. And the purpose that our salvation is all oriented towards. Worship is important. And that's the, the theme that we see coming out of Leviticus chapter 10 this morning. The lesson that we're given from this passage is that we must glorify God by worshiping him only as he has commanded we must glorify God by worshiping him only as he has commanded. I want us to consider this under two headings. We'll see first, God's standard for worship, and second, God's concern for worship. So look with me at verse 1. We see God's standard for worship. And we saw the, the context is, in Leviticus 9, the people have drawn near in worship, and the glory of the Lord has appeared, the fire has come out and consumed the sacrifice, and they fall down in praise and in worship. And we come in Verse 1 of chapter 10, and see that Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. I'll read the entire passage so you can have it in view before you this morning. And fire came out from before the presence, from before the Lord, and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. 
and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. This is God's word. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of our God stands forever. We see that context. They, they come and they, they come right out of the context of Leviticus 9 when the people bring worship that is accepted and the glory of God appears. They come now and they bring unauthorized fire. Literally, the text says strange fire. Now, we're not exactly sure what it is that they've done that makes this be counted as strange fire. There's a whole long list that scholars will give. It could be that they took the coals from the wrong place. Instead of getting them from the altar, they got them from somewhere else. And so it was the wrong type of coals that they weren't to use. There's a, a recipe for the incense given in the book of Exodus. And it could be that they brought a different type of incense than what was prescribed. It could be based on later in Leviticus 10, when they're exhorted not to come having drunk wine, it could be that they were drunk when they came to bring this sacrifice before the Lord. Uh, at the end of the day, everyone kind of comes to the place where they say, we really have no idea specifically what they did. But the clear thing is that it was strange fire. A good translation is unauthorized fire, because that's what they brought, something that was not authorized by God. And that comes out when it says that they brought something that the Lord had not commanded them. Just notice two things from that, that the Lord had not commanded them. First, you see the pattern from chapters 8 and 9. Over and over again, we've been told that they did as the Lord had commanded through Moses. Something like 17 times that's reinforced for us in chapters 8 and 9. They worshiped according to the rule. They did it as the Lord had commanded by Moses, just as the Lord commanded. It's as God commanded, so they did. That's the pattern that's been established for two chapters now. And so it should be strange and surprising to us that now as we come to chapter 10, instead of being told that they worshiped as the Lord commanded, we're told that Nadab and Abihu brought strange fire, which the Lord had not commanded. It may be surprising that they would do such a thing, but it should not be surprising that it does not go well for them. That's the first thing we see is this, this pattern sets us up to be shocked by what Nadab and Abihu do. But the second thing we see is that they did what was not commanded. That's an, an important thing to notice. It's not that they did what was forbidden. It's not as if God said, do not do this, and they transgressed God's law by doing what God had forbidden. Rather, the text said they did what the Lord had not commanded. In other words, they went beyond what was written. They invented their own ways of coming before the Lord by their own imaginations. They decided to worship the Lord in a manner that saw, they saw fit rather than according to what God had said in his word. They drew near to the Lord in worship, not in a way that God had explicitly forbidden them from doing, but nevertheless in a way that God had never encouraged them to do, in a way that God had never told them or invited them to do. They, they took it into their own hands to approach the Lord in their own way, on their own terms, by doing what was not commanded. You probably will not hang around a Reformed and Presbyterian church for very long before you hear us talk about three letters, RPW. That stands for the regulative principle of worship. And it's, it's drawn, it's our view of worship that's drawn from places in the scripture like Leviticus chapter 10. The, the regulative principle of worship says that, that God cares not only that he is worshipped, but he cares about how he is worshipped. And the, the idea of a regulative principle says that something needs to regulate, needs to govern, needs to direct how we approach God in worship, the things that we do and the things that we don't do. And, and what we say when we confess this truth, we say that worship needs to be governed according to God's word. We worship according to his word. We do what he has said and we don't do what he has not said. When we gather together to worship the Lord, what we're, what we're saying that we believe the scripture teaches from places like Leviticus chapter 10 is that the only things we do in worship are the things that the Lord has instructed us to do. Either the things that he has explicitly told us in his word or the things that by good and necessary consequence we can deduce from his word, that we can infer from his word. It, it, it's not saying that every single detail of our service has a chapter and verse. There's no order of worship written for you in the pages of scripture. 
We do need to use biblical wisdom and, and do things in accordance with biblical principles. We're told to preach God's word, but we're not told which passage to preach on which Sunday. And so we need to use the, the principles of preaching the whole counsel of God and proclaiming Christ crucified in order to understand what does it look like to shape the life of preaching. But we are told that we are to proclaim God's word when we gather. So we, we shape our worship according to God's word, and we don't do anything in worship other than what the Lord has positively encouraged us to do from his word. That's a, that's a very different approach to worship than you might find in many places today. Maybe if you were to go around in, into different places, the most common approach to worship that you might find is something like this. What's not forbidden is permissible. As long as God has said, don't do it, then we must be okay to do it. We're, we're within those bounds. But we, we're actually arguing for something much different. I hope you hear the difference. Rather than saying what's, not, what's forbidden, what's not forbidden is permissible, we're saying what's not commanded is forbidden. If we cannot go to the scriptures and say, where does God in his word tell us that this is something we ought to do when we gather for worship, then we do not go beyond what is written. We do what God has commanded, nothing more and nothing less as we worship and gather into his presence. Why would that be? Why, why would we be so strict in our approach to worship? Why would we be so, uh, so strict in, in these things? Why, why not do other things that are meaningful to many others? Why, why don't you find drama and skits and interpretive dance in Reformed churches? Why don't we survey the community around us and find out the worship practices that are most desirable to them and orient our service around those things? It's interesting. You can find study after study that shows that, that people learn better visually than audibly. And so why is our service centered around the proclaimed word of God in the sermon? They'll tell you, my generation and younger don't like to be talked at, so why, why do it this way? Why do we worship the way that we do? Let me, let me suggest it's not because we hate fun. It, it's not because we're anti-emotional and, and all of these things. No, friends, we, we do this the way we do out of a deep-seated conviction of who is being worshipped. We don't gather... For our own sake, we gather to worship the Lord, to honor and glorify his name. He is the one that's being worshipped, and that means he gets to tell us what he likes and how we are to do it. I don't know if you've ever made this mistake. Lee's not here to correct me, but I don't think I've made this mistake. But, but many of us maybe have, where you, you get your wife, maybe husbands, on, on your anniversary, you get your wife a present, and, and instead of running late trying to scramble what to get, you're actually excited because this year you found the perfect gift, and you're actually, you got it ready ahead of time, and you're just excited to give it to her, and you find out that when you give it to her, she's just not as excited about it as you thought she'd be. And come to find out, she's actually a little bit offended by what you got her, and the reason is you got her the perfect gift for yourself, but not anything that she's interested in. And as you talk about it, she, she helps you to realize that your, your choice of a gift was actually a little bit more self-centered and oriented around yourself and what you like rather than around her. And you didn't take into consideration who she is and what she likes and what she desires. Friends, we must not do that in worship. We must not come and give worship that the Puritans called will worship, worships that is according to our own desires and our own whims and our own likes because we are not the ones who are being worshipped. If worship was about me, we'd have a buffet instead of a sermon. The Lord is being worshipped. He is the one that gets to decide what he likes and how he desires us to draw near. He is the object of our worship. And to put it bluntly, that means what you and I like is quite irrelevant to the equation. We come into God's presence doing those things that he has commanded, not doing those things that he has not commanded giving him the worship that he desires and that he's pleased to accept. Maybe to get a little bit more concrete, what does that mean that we do? I mean, Lord, Lord willing, hopefully you see that week after week as we try to worship according to God's word, but we can unpack a little bit in broad categories what it is that we do when we worship God. Pastor Terry Johnson, who's the pastor of the Independent Presbyterian Church down in Savannah, Georgia, has summarized it really helpfully when he says that when we worship, we essentially do five things. 
We read the Bible, we preach the Bible, we pray the Bible, we sing the Bible, and we see the Bible. Seeing the Bible is a reference to the sacraments, when you not only hear God's word proclaimed in your hearing, but you see tangible, visible signs and seals, God's visible words in bread and wine and water poured out. We, we do those things oriented around God's word because they're explicitly commanded for us to do. We read, preach, pray, sing God's word, and we administer the sacraments. The standard is given in God's word. It's what he has commanded, not any more and not any less. We must not go beyond what is written and give him worship that he has not commanded. That's the mistake that Nadab and Abihu make as they draw near to God with this unauthorized fire, offering him worship that he has never commanded them to give him, never invited them to give him in worship. That's the standard God lays out for us in worship. Second, we see God's concern for worship. Look with me at at verses 2 and 3. Verse 2, we'll read again just to remind ourselves. Fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. It's interesting that there's a a stark contrast and yet parallel there with the end of chapter 9. At the end of chapter 9, fire also comes out from before the Lord and consumes. But that time it consumes the sacrifice as a sign of it being accepted. And the people fall down and worship the Lord, crying out in praise with rejoicing. And yet here, fire again comes out. Fire again consumes and people fall down. But the people themselves are consumed and they fall down, struck dead before the presence of God for coming to worship in a manner that he had not invited. And I think maybe if, if you're anything like me, maybe we, we struggle with that a bit. I think maybe we hear the standard that God has for worship, and as we hold it up to the scriptures, it makes sense. It might be new to us, but I think it makes sense. God's the one that is being worshipped. He wants us to worship according to his word. That part we get, but when we come and see his reaction here, we almost wonder if it's a little bit harsh. If God has overreacted in the way that he has dealt with Nadab and Abihu, and of course God is perfect in every way, and so he never reacts any way other than what is perfectly just and holy and good. And so it's not a a harsh overreaction. But I think maybe the reason we're tempted to think that way, the reason we're tempted to, to wonder if God is harsh, is maybe because we don't fully grasp God's own concern for his holiness and for his own glory. That's the answer that Moses gives that brings Aaron to silence before God. He's about to protest what God has done and and grieve over his children, and yet Moses responds to him in a way that leaves him silent. He says, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. Those who are near him, especially the priests who draw near to him in worship, God says, among all the people, they need to regard his glory, but most especially the priests who draw near with the sacrifices need to come in a way that shows an understanding of his holiness. That's what he means when he says he will be sanctified. That's the same word as as holy. In other words, God's saying he will vindicate his own holiness. He will show himself to be holy. Among those who draw near him, he will be regarded as holy. The holiness of God is one of his perfections. John Brown of Haddington in his Systematic Theology says this, he says, the holiness of God is that essential perfection of his nature, which lies in perfect freedom from and hatred of all sin and in perfect love to everything holy and pure. God's holiness is that perfection of his being that means he hates what is evil and loves what is good, that he is separate from what is evil and entirely good. In him is light and there is no darkness at all. He is holy. It speaks that he is the one who dwells in unapproachable light. It speaks of his moral purity and his excellence. He reveals himself as holy many times. He is the holy one of Israel. It's the holiness of God that had Isaiah so terrified in Isaiah chapter 6 when he comes and sees a vision of God seated on his throne and the angels proclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God 
of hosts. And he realizes that he's in the presence of a holy God and he is a man of unclean lips and he dwells in the midst of a people of unclean lips and no one can see God's face and live and his eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And he is undone before the presence of a holy God. It's God's holiness that drives his people to worship. We see that that same name repeated in Revelation 4. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the saints and angels cast their crowns before his feet and praise his name forever and ever. It's God's holiness that we pray for in the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. When we say, hallowed be thy name. May your name be regarded as holy. May we and all else rightly esteem and honor and adore you as the holy God. Hallowed be thy name. To to fail to regard God's holiness is one way that we take his name in vain. He says that he will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Nadab and Abihu are an example of the Lord vindicating his holy name in the presence of the people. We see God's holiness. Maybe the the clearest way we see God's holiness is his holiness revealed in Christ, in his person, and in who he is, as one who is innocent and unstained and separate from sinners, who is exalted above the heavens, Hebrews tells us. We see the holiness of God in the sinlessness of Christ, in Christ's love for God's law. He says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. In his zeal for God's house and for his glory. We see his holiness in his person as the son of God who's taken on our flesh. One person in two natures. The the holiness of God revealed in our nature. We see his holiness in his person, but we also see his holiness in his work. We see his holiness shine forth in in Christ's perfect obedience, that he fulfilled all righteousness. He did all that the Father commanded him to do. We see his holiness, as we said, in his zeal for God's house when he cleanses the temple and shows his concern for proper worship of God. We see his holiness shine forth. We see his holiness in his suffering and in his death because his suffering on the cross shows what the holiness of God demands our sin has to be dealt with. God's holiness has to be vindicated. And Christ, the Holy One of God, comes and suffers in our place, bearing God's wrath. Just as the sacrifice was consumed in Leviticus 9 in the place of the people, Christ had the fullness of God's wrath poured out upon him so that we might be spared from it. Not only in in the reality of his suffering and his death, showing the the demand of God's holiness, but even in the purpose of his suffering and death, he came in order to redeem us and make us holy because God is holy and he loves holiness and he wants his people to be his holy people. And so he came to make us holy and he's coming back on the last day as one who is exalted in glory and his holiness will shine forth as he takes away sin forever. We see God's holiness revealed in Christ, and the Lord wants his people to know that he will be regarded as holy by all who draw near before him in worship. He will show himself holy. He will vindicate his holiness, and he says he will be glorified. That's our chief end. That's question one of our catechism. The main reason we exist, our primary purpose in life, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. When we glorify God, it's not as if we we give him something that he didn't have, but we ascribe glory to him. We magnify and exalt his name. We extol and adore him for his perfections and his works. And we do that supremely and especially in worship. And that's why this thing that Nadab and Abihu have done is such a serious violation of God's law. Because if the primary place where we worship and adore and ascribe glory to our God is in worship, than to draw near in a way that makes worship more about us and what we want than about God's glory is to rob him of his glory. And he says he will be glorified before all the people. 
Scholars point out that, that God deals swiftly with Nadab and Abihu in this time to show right from the very start of Israel's worship how serious a thing it is to come into his presence and worship. And he doesn't want to let this practice go on and let further abuses come in. And so he, he deals swiftly right from the beginning, dealing, showing that, that no one is exempt, not even Aaron's own sons, one of whom was to be the next high priest. Not even they can draw near to God in a manner of their own choosing, but only as he calls them to. God has concern for his worship that he be regarded as holy and he be glorified by all those who come and draw near into his presence. What does all that, that mean for us as God's people? Let me suggest it, it helps us to understand the posture in which we draw near to God and worship. We're to draw near in worship, yes, with joy. It's a wonderful blessing that God's invited us into his presence, that we can come and praise his name. We should come joyfully, but we should not come lightly. We come with a posture of reverence and awe. That's what the writer to the Hebrews says, I, I believe, echoing our passage this morning from Leviticus 10, when he tells us, in Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 28, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. We draw near with reverence and awe because to worship the triune God is serious business. I so appreciate David and Tony each week, one of the last things they say after they give announcements without fail is prepare your hearts for worship. Th those aren't throwaway words. That's not just to smooth out the transition as they go to sit down. That's because you're coming into the presence of a holy God and you and I need to pause to get our hearts right to understand what it is that we are about to do. We cannot, we dare not come into God's presence lightly without thought of who he is and what it means to come before his throne and praise his holy name of what a privilege it is that in Christ we're invited before his throne. We must take a few moments to prepare our hearts for the work that we are about to do as the call to worship is issued and we sing his praises and we hear his word and we praise his name. Shows us the posture that we draw near to God in with reverence and awe, with respect for who he is and a delight and, and uh, awe at his glory and his holiness. But it also reminds us what a beautiful thing that the writer to the Hebrews says, let us offer to God acceptable worship. What an astounding thing it is to hear that sinners can offer acceptable worship to God. He is the God beyond all praising. All of our praises fall short of, of the glory of who he is. We can never accurately, comprehensively, we can accurately, but not, not comprehensively describe his glory and ascribe it to him. It all falls short. We need the spirit to sanctify our worship, and yet we're invited to draw near and offer worship that God will be pleased to accept. And that shows us our need for Christ, that it's in Christ we have access to the Father. Through him in one spirit, we have access to him. We come in his name as those who have had our sins washed away by his blood, who are clothed in his righteousness and welcomed into his presence with access. Not only are we invited to come, but we're invited to come boldly before his throne of grace, to come in confidence that we will receive grace and receive help in our time of need, that he will not cast us away in judgment, that he will not consume us with the fire, but that he will send us with his blessings every time we draw near in his son, because Christ is the one who brings us access. He enables our worship as the one who's made atonement for us and pours out his spirit upon us to call us out of darkness into his marvelous light so that we can be enabled to proclaim his excellencies through the work of regeneration to make us born again so that we are alive in Christ and, and have the desire and the ability to praise his name. Through the Spirit who makes us holy, we are holy as saints now and we're being made more and more holy as we're conformed into the image of Christ so that actually we're able when we gather into his presence to lift holy hands in prayer. To give him the worship that he is pleased to accept as we worship in his Son. 
Peter tells us it's, it's as living stones were being built up in Christ who is the living stone so that we can be a spiritual priesthood who offers sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And the only reason that you and I can offer worship to God that is acceptable is because Christ is the great high priest who has offered himself as the sacrifice that was once for all accepted by God. He didn't draw near like Nadab and Abihu did and offer what was not commanded. He fulfilled all righteousness and did precisely everything that his father had commanded him to do and then laid down his life in a way that was perfectly accepted to satisfy divine justice and to reconcile us to God. And he rose again on the third day to vindicate his own holiness and his glory and his salvation to show that we have life in Christ and are accepted in him. He is the one who enables us to worship, who makes our worship acceptable, who leads us in worship. Psalm 22 says it's in the midst of his brothers that he declares praise and he stands leading the assembly in worship as we come and praise our God. Friends, our, our only hope is to draw near to God in Christ. It's, it's our duty to come and worship and yet it's our wonderful privilege as God's redeemed people to come and bring him acceptable worship. Worship in reverence and in awe for who he is Worship that we seek as best we're able to be in conformity and obedience to his word. But worship that we trust by grace that he will be pleased to accept and promises that every time we come into his presence, he will meet with us and he will bless us. Friends, if, if you're not in Christ, that means you can't offer him worship that's pleasing in his sight. And that means you, you need to see your need to come to Christ. Your only hope is to turn from your sins and to cast yourself completely upon the Savior with reverence and all that you might bow before him as your Lord, the one who gave his life to redeem sinners and invite us to come and find life and salvation in him, the one who is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, who alone deserves all honor and praise and glory and worship. This is our God. This is the one we're invited to come and proclaim his name and worship him and his excellencies. If you don't know him, come to him. For those of you who do know him, have the joy of gathering into his presence to proclaim his name. Week by week, let us, as the psalmist tells us, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. To ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name to worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Having received a kingdom that cannot be shaken, having confidence in Christ that we are his and he is ours, and that his kingdom will never end, having received a kingdom that cannot shake, be shaken, let us draw near with reverence and awe, and let us offer our God acceptable worship, knowing by his grace he is pleased to accept it. Acceptable worship for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, what a blessing it is to be your people, to come into your presence to worship you. That we would have access in your Son by your Spirit to come before you, Father, and to proclaim your praises and your glory. We pray, Lord, that you would be honored and you would be exalted in all that we do as we worship you week by week. That we would extol your perfections, that we would ascribe to you the glory that's due your name, that we would worship you in a way that is pleasing in your sight, that you would be honored by all that we say and all that we do. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.